I thought it was like you two up here and then me way down here. Wait, you put me you somewhere near Brad? Dead. Get out of here. You're done. It's over. You can slouch all you want. I'm 60, you can't insult me like that. I'm 62. Lucas thought Drew was pretty close to 62. <laughs> I've never been more devastated in my I life. I wouldn't say I thought you were close to 62. I was just like, I'm young and you both are not young. So. Oh, I'm oh not young. <laughs> Not young. Because to me, I'm 21 and you have four kids. So that's like on a different <laughs> life stage than me. Okay. But I wouldn't say you're the same life stage as Brad, you know? Lucas, let me teach you something. When you dig a hole. No, I like to keep digging. <laughs> at some point, you need no, to stop. No, I like to keep digging. <laughs> Somehow you're like, thing. no, no, no. And I'm like, what? Why when am I going down, down? Below the level I'm going to go ground. home and tell my wife. Our goal on this podcast is to know Jesus better and by the power of his spirit, do better. So together, we can be a little better. Well, welcome to A Little Better. So glad to have you here. And uh, we are on week four. Time moves on in the Unsung Heroes series. And first off, sorry, we missed you all last week. Um, Well, (coughs) I think Drew did that deliberately just to make the point. But uh, (laughs) we we did give Drew the week off last week. And if you heard week three, uh, message was powerful. Uh, The voice... Was not. Not so much. I mean, there was, it was a struggle. You've been sick for like 10 days. Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, we gave him a break last week. You know, he's hanging in there, and we're going to try to get caught up here on week four. So we really did talk about Jonathan in week three, mm-hmm. and this week you covered Mordecai. And why don't we just jump to it as far as Mordecai is concerned. Give us your sermon in 60. Yeah, we looked at the unsung hero of Mordecai and his influence on even a greater hero in Esther. And what we see in Mordecai really ultimately is a faithful man in uncertain times. And so we talked about how we as Christians, no matter the uncertainty that we face, need to remain faithful to God. No matter what culture we're living in, whether we're exiles in a different land, whether culture is pushing against us, like we stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so a couple of things in this sermon to remember is uh, our uncertainty doesn't lead to fear. It mm-hmm. builds faith. Um, God's always working, and He's on His throne. And so, crazy the timing. We didn't plan it, but God just knows He's sovereign. Even in the message we preached, like what a powerful message in the cur- current cultural climate mm-hmm. that we're in. Yeah, yeah, a very yeah uncertain times for sur- for sure. Very divisive times. Yeah. You know, um, tough to find our way. Well, listen, I want to welcome back to the podcast, Lucas, our pastoral Ooh. resident. Um, he must have done okay the first time because we invited him back. But yeah. uh, let's give it Cold another shot one. here. So um, I'm just going to jump to you, Lucas, just in terms of what what grabbed you most about this message. I love the story of Esther and Mordecai, mm-hmm. and I love it because both Esther and Mordecai are heroes in the story. Mm-hmm. And I think Drew captured that really, really well in his yeah. sermon, where Esther inevitably is the one that convinces the king to bring them freedom. But if it wasn't for Mordecai, I don't think anything of any of, the, any of this wouldn't happen. And right. both of them are heroes in the story. Right. And I think both of them deserve to be labeled heroes in the story, which I, which mm-hmm. I loved. I thought that was justly done. So. Yeah. Like a number of our unsung heroes have been women because women are often overlooked. Yep. In this case, Esther, not so much. Yep. I mean, Esther is one of two women who have a book of the Bible mm-hmm. named after yep. them. So Esther does get a spotlight, rightly so, yep. you know, and she is a hero. But I guess, according to Drew, you know, Mordecai is Alfred and Esther is Batman. <laughs> is that, that I mean, how it works? I think you could totally run with that. Um, <laughs> I think Alfred and his relationship with Batman is similar to... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, his relationship with Esther. He's influencing Similar, the person okay. who is, I know. He's, 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 <laughs> um, yeah. I want to run with that word influence. This is, I mean, I didn't even talk to you guys about this ahead of time, but what I'm impressed with, with Mordecai and with Alfred, right? You just talk about that is, you know, the mentor, you know, Alfred was, you know, to Batman as a young boy, but the mentor Mordecai was, yeah. the voice of wisdom, you know, mm-hmm. to Esther. And I was just kind of curious about mentorship, you know, where, who, who have been some of your influences, who have been the people who have like shaped you, given you wisdom, and people might look to you, but they don't know the role that someone else played. You, in where Brad. You are today. What? 
you. How, <laughs> I paid him for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to. Curious, in what way would you say that? I, I, I mean, I, I really, well, I I'm a little. <laughs> oh, good. That's that. That that makes more sense. <laughs> Far more sense. Um, but you must have had people who you would yeah. look back. I mean, I can think of people who yeah. shaped me along the way. But what are what are some of the people who've done? In that? all honesty, Brad. I do look up to you a great deal. So even though that was a joke, Uh love you, Brad. But um, I think one of the biggest influences that I've had in my life um, was my shepherd is what we call it at Liberty University. He Mm. was basically my boss, but he just like cared for me in a way that just kind of like a dad Mm -hmm. would. Um, Just like every step of the way when I really felt like uncertain and I really felt like I didn't know what to do or even when I like screwed up big time and like, like there was a time where he went, or I did something that really almost hurt his name. And he was like, why did you do that? This like put it almost like a stain on my record because I vouched for you and you went and did this. And then, but in every step of the way, he was just like gracious and compassionate and merciful to me. And he was so kind in everything I did. Um, and the influence he had on my life was so profound because just the way that he showed me kindness influenced now how I look at my relationships with so many other people. Cause I'm like, I I'm very like justice oriented where I'm like, Oh, you did something wrong. You deserve to get punished. But that wasn't what was shown to me. And mm-hmm. that wasn't, that's not what's been shown to me in my whole life, even with like the gospel. And so that's just the thing that he's taught that he taught me. He instilled in me that I live with on a constant basis. We're like, Oh yeah, maybe he does deserve to be punished, but we live mercifully because that's how Jesus lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I think when you think of mentorship, I think a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't correlate this, but I think the greatest mentors are parents. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom and dad are huge mentors in my life, right? Obviously they raised me. They, they are the godly example. So I think those are, um, for many people, uh, just a huge mentor. I think of, you know, even my Southern parents, um, not my biological parents, but the influence that they had in my life and still do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think of, other pastors, the pastor I grew up with, his name was Richard Tintle. And uh, yeah, I mean, again, we, we, we've we narrowed mentorship in down, down to like, I have coffee with you on a regular basis. But I think that it's bigger than that. I mm-hmm. think it's, you know, a man who faithfully preached God's word and, and showed me an example of just a, a godly, faithful teacher of his word. And like, mm-hmm. he never sat down with me like, hey, this is how you preach. And But like, I learned so much sitting under his teaching and mm-hmm. it was like a mentorship role. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there, I have, you know, mentors in my life now that um, speak into me and, and care for me and challenge me, so. Mm-hmm. I think uh, when you say it's not just someone, you know, you have coffee with and listen to what they have to say, it's like, it's not just a book, right? We could all say, well, just go read books, yeah. right? Just go read books. But for me, I know it's been very different where I, I have read books, but I still don't know what it looks like in real life. Mm. And so for me, it's been a series of the churches that I've been in. I've just been privileged to always you know, have a close relationship with the pastor. I, I, when I was in junior high, I mean, I would you know, go and see Ralph Gruenberg was the pastor here, Mm. you know, at Northridge and go into his office and just talk to him. But, but mentors for me, you watch them do life. Yeah. Right. It's just like, Oh, that's okay. Oh, you can do that. Oh, Mm. I mean, there's just so much you don't understand until you see someone living it out and how they, how they interact uh, with others. Um, so let's talk about, I mean, you had three big points, you know, in this sermon. And the first one was to remain faithful, hold on to faith in uncertain times. And I'm sure that, yeah, I, we live in uncertain times and, um, it's easy to get wrapped up in the moment, in the news, be, you know, to doom scroll your phone or just watch, you know, what's going on and you get caught up in that. What do you say to someone who's just all wrapped up around the axle on what's going on in the world around them? Yeah, I mean, one, um, uncertainty is going to happen throughout your life, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when things are uncertain, I think this is the hope of the gospel is it, despite uncertainty, I have certainty, Mm -hmm. right? And what I mean by that is no matter what 
happens in this world, I am certain that my future is secure, that I have a home that's everlasting. And so that's the one thing that the gospel provides is certainty despite that surrounding uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why I put my hope ultimately not in my circumstances that change all the time, but in the, the rock of what Jesus did for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you're, you're, you're in uncertainty, I would challenge you to step, like uh, I think I said this uh, in the message, is like uncertainty often causes a, a sinful fear, right, mm-hmm. of... Uh, I'm afraid, I'm worried, I'm full of anxiety. And fear often <laughs> has a tendency to keep us paralyzed mm-hmm. in uncertainty, yeah. right? When I'm afraid, I usually don't act. Mm-hmm. I think what you mm-hmm. see in contrary is Mordecai. What I don't think he was afraid. I think he had a faith in who God was that caused him not to stay still, but to act mm-hmm. and fight and stay stand up for what was right, Mm -hmm. which moved him to Esther and saying, Mm -hmm. we need you to do this. And you spend so much time in week one about the right kind of fear, you know, the fear of God and when that shapes us, but, but fear of each other, fear of the world for fear of circumstances, you know, that, that gets to me, you know, as well. Lucas, feel free to jump in anytime. I see you (laughs) nodding over there, but I mean, you're a we we established early on that you're a much younger person in oh, the room here. So, much younger, yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think your peers are going through right now? What do you think? What do you think um, their vulnerabilities are as far as anxiety and the world and just what? What do you find is your lifeline? You know, and uh, what what are they struggling with and how do they get yeah. over it? Do you specifically mean? Christian peers, non-Christian peers. Well, that's a good all question. I didn't. That, I would probably be interested in both answers. Okay. You know, um, because I do think that, yeah, the gospel is such an incredible message to <laughs> people without a hope yeah. in uncertain mm-hmm. times. But as Christians, it doesn't instantly make it all better, right? Yeah. We no, there 100%. is a struggle there too. Yep. So, so what do you? Um, how would you yeah. encourage your friends? Loaded and question. How have um, you over? I mean, maybe you're drowning, you know. But uh, or are or do you feel like you've you've been able to find some ways to yeah. hold strong in, yeah. in certain times? Um, so to answer your, I, I guess I'll split this up into three different questions. But okay. um, non Christians, I have seen to be among my peers, among my friends who don't believe in Jesus anxiety is a ever present trouble for them um, where they just don't know what's going to happen. What's going to happen tomorrow with my friends? What's going to happen with my boyfriend, girlfriend? What's going to happen with the election? And these things that are just um, big deals seem way bigger to them than maybe they necessarily need to be. And um, I found in contrast that uh, a lot of my Christian friends are worried about different things um, such as, what is the will of God for my life? Mm -hmm. What does God want me to do with my life? What am I going to do Mm -hmm. as a job? What am I going to do to find a wife? Am I going to have a family? Things like that, things that are also important, um, but things that uh, God will provide. Mm -hmm. I actually think that's, even if you lop, you know, forget non-Christian, Christian, Christian, I think that's one of the biggest things for young people is, what is my future, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, what's my future for, like, I, I just graduated college, what's my job? What, what, you know, I'm not married yet. I'm still single. What, what does that future look like? And I actually think, you know, you find a unique answer to that struggle in Mordecai's advice to, um, Esther, like for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. And I think what God teaches young people is it's not about always where you're going. It's about where you are. A hundred percent. And like let's not let's not wait for God mm-hmm. to take me where I want to be so I can be used by him. Why not I be right used now. where I am right yep. now so mm-hmm. he can take me to where he wants me to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um and I love that that piece of advice that Mordecai says, right? That takes a faithful man to mm-hmm. see beyond his circumstances, mm-hmm. beyond like yo, my race might be destroyed right mm-hmm. now, but Esther, don't miss this. You Mm -hmm. are where you are. Young person listening, old person, you are where you are right now because God's got a purpose for you. And he wants to use you for such a time as this. And it doesn't have to be, I think a lot of people feel like, ah, but I'm not going to save an entire race. Yeah, like don't downplay what God can do in what seems insignificant to you. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah. well, and as 
an older person in the room. <laughs> Um, I would say the uncertainty index today is fairly high. You know, I've lived through a few decades and there's always uncertainty. Oh yeah. Always uncertainty. But worldwide, you know, <coughs> we've just got, you know, unbelievable numbers of refugees. There's world conflicts, there's wars, we, you know, alliance. There's all kinds of stuff out there to get nervous about. And then here at home, there's, you know, economy, inflation, career and stability. I, I do... And just so many questions, you know, have been thrown up in the air that weren't asked, you know, when I was younger, you know, sure. about identity and everything. I was just, mm. there's just to be so many things that I do think the uncertainty index is extremely high today. I think, though, if we trace that, the root cause of that uncertainty, again, I think it ties back to, to what Israel was going through. We forget, like, that uncertainty comes because our world is changing. And... Mm-hmm we feel uncertain because we've made this world our home. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think we miss, we get so caught up in the things that are changing in America and with elections, and it causes us to be like, oh no, where is it Mm -hmm. going? It's because we've gotten so used to being comfortable here, like making America what we want it to be. And I think the story reminds us that if I saw myself as an exile, if I saw myself out of my home, I'm not sure I would be so caught up in the uncertainty again because I have certainty in store for me. Right, right. That's such a good point. Yeah. Yeah. What am I uncertain about? Am I uncertain about being rich or happy or healthy? Yeah. Yeah. You know, or am I uncertain about God finishing what he started? Yes. And that being good for us. And I think if we're honest, it's not the latter, Mm -hmm. it's the former, right? I think we feel uncertainty because inflation because mm-hmm. i'm not i don't have as much spending power as i mm-hmm. use like those things cause us to lose our security because we've put our hope mm-hmm. in things of this world when we're not of this world right. which is idolatry it's it misplaced is. Yeah. Yes. trust or hope or whatever yep we're having a great talk here <laughs> excuse me i do want to get on to points 2 and 3 so like <laughs> number 2 was humility and pride god mm-hmm. opposes the God opposes the proud, but gives, what was it? Strength, grace to the favor, humble. Yeah. Favor to yeah. the humble. And we see that huge contrast oh, yeah. in this story between Mordecai and Haman. Haman mm-hmm. is the pinnacle of pride. Mm. And I don't know, if have either of you been to, like I've had Jewish friends that um, like they'll, they'll celebrate Feast of Purim every year and they'll do an Esther play. Have you mm. ever been? <laughs> but it's so fun because they, 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 they do the play with Esther and Mordecai and Haman. Every time Haman steps into the room, everyone you know, stomps and boos oh and gosh. everything. It's just That's awesome. Fun. But it's this huge, huge contrast. But I did think it was a powerful point in your message when you said, if you're proud... You know, you got a bullseye on your back. God is mm. your enemy. God opposes you. And it just, what, I mean, we're not supposed to be scaredy cats. What's the appropriate posture, you know, for a Christian? I mean, humility is, the hard part is pride is so, so slippery. And so it's like pride is one of our greatest blind spots. Mm-hmm. Even in our humility, we find pride. Like mm-hmm. we're proud that we're humble. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's like, oh wait, doesn't that defeat the purpose? Yep. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, you know, it's yeah. it, it's so hard because our flesh longs mm-hmm. for the mm-hmm. things Haman longed for. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. And you know, we make Haman into be this bad guy, but if we were in his shoes with if his I was power, trash talked. Come on, bow mm-hmm. down to me, bow down to me. You know, we don't we in our culture that's unique, uh-huh. but we do live that way. We uh-huh. want credit for things that we do good. Oh yeah. Um, we want people to like us. There's yeah. so many ways. And pride isn't uh-huh. always this like worship me. Uh-huh. Pride is often found in our insecurities. Yeah. Um, and so it's really hard to be humble. It mm-hmm. is. And e- like I said, even when we are humble, we usually are proud. Yeah. Pride. I'm so humble. Yeah, Look at exactly. me. <laughs> I was thinking about that song, right? Oh, Lord, it's hard What's to be humble. What's your greatest strength? <laughs> I'm humble. <laughs> you know, like, it's, yeah. you know, and then you think about Jesus, who is the perfect example of humility. And then you, you recognize, like, oh, most powerful person became least person. Nah, I'm not humble. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I like the phrase humble confidence. Um, I think I would, 
You knew we weren't going to get through a podcast without me mentioning Tim Keller, but I think Tim <laughs> Keller is fond of that phrase, humble confidence, where a Christian, they're humble because there's absolutely no credit you know, for what we have. Yep. It is a gift of God. Yep. It's the mm-hmm. empowerment of God. But there is confidence because God is at work. I want to go to the third and final uh, point, which is that God is on the throne. And just... Um, for me, I remember over 40 years ago reading Chuck Colson's book, Kingdoms in Conflict, and he bases that on the work of Augustine, City of God. But just drawing this, con- you know, this, this contrast that every Christian should know, like the kingdoms of this world you know, can only do so much, but mm-hmm. it's the kingdom of God yep. that's supreme. And that's always been helpful for me because I do get tied up in politics. I do you get wrapped up in sure. it. And it's just like, I want my guy, my gal to win, you know, because they're going to fix it all. But it's so easy to just think that politics will accomplish what only the kingdom of God can. Mm. So how do you guys, I mean, where would you put yourselves on that spectrum of, hey, I am so detached from all of that, it doesn't bother me at all, or what ways do you find yourselves having to remind yourself of that truth? It's hard because the, like, there are things in politics that are that deal with what we believe yeah. and mm-hmm. what we stand for. Sure. Um, so I think just to be completely ignorant or mm-hmm. in oblivion is, mm-hmm. isn't helpful either. Yeah. Right. Um, cause as Christians, we're called to stand up for truth, right? right. For God's truth, sure. we're to fight for, you know, all kinds of things. And so mm-hmm. I think it's important to, to be engaged right. at a certain level, but like, I think engagement has, has slipped into worship, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. like it's, you can be engaged, but when you, when you feel this emotional sway one way or the other, like so many people today are either mourning or celebrating. And it's Mm kind of like, I want to be in the middle of that where I'm like, Hey, you know what? It went my way or it didn't go my way. At the end of the day, Mm -hmm. it's in the hands of God. And that's Mm -hmm. where my trust and my hope is. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also want to stand up for the things of God. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Chuck Colson's hero in that book is Wilberforce, you know, was the British parliamentarian who um, campaigned for the end of the slave trade. Um, You know, Britain didn't have slaves, but they still allowed the slave trade mm -hmm. and for Britain to back out of the slave trade. That was his lifelong work. But again, so he was a Christian. He was you know, pursuing the kingdom of God, but God called him to be engaged in the world, you know, to be a politician Mm -hmm. and to do good. But what guided him was the image of God, you know, in every person and their value, you know, you know, and ending that. So God may be calling you, you know, to be a politician, you know, your place might be in ministry in the church, but it could be a holy calling in politics. It could be a holy calling in the corporate world. It could be holy calling in healthcare, you know, other places where, you're a for kingdom such a time citizen as this, right? for such yeah. a time as this. We were having a conversation in, in our summer group. Um, just a bunch of like people my age were like, "What am I going to do with my life?" Like I was saying earlier, and I remember like the, there's like so many verses in the Bible that are constantly talking about the will of God, and I think we use the will of God kind of like flippantly, like, "Oh, the will of God is for me to be a politician, it's for me to be a doctor, it's for me to do this and that and have a wife," and and, and it's so interesting because like he'll talk about the will of God, and Paul's like, "This is the will of God." your sanctification. It's mm. not for you to be a doctor. It's not for you to do this. Maybe God does call you to that, in which case it is his will. part of it. Yeah, it's part of his will. But at the end of the day, his will for you is your sanctification. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge part of his will where we don't have to be in a specific situation to be faithful. We can be faithful right now in yeah. a, as a politician or as a pastoral resident. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. I'm watching the clock. This is a great discussion. It's going kind of long. I mean, the last thing I wanted to do was just have you, Drew, remind people of how this story connected or reminded you of the gospel. I know you made, you know, you know, you know, that point in there. But again, it's so easy to say, you know, learn lessons of how to live life well. But in the end, there's it's not us, you know, that accomplishes it, is it? Yeah. I mean, here God is remaining faithful to his people mm-hmm. despite the attacks on them. And mm-hmm. I think it's just a reminder of 
despite who we are, um, despite our our sinfulness, God is faithful to us, right? Mm-hmm. The cross and his resurrection is the ultimate piece of evidence to mm-hmm. that, of his faithfulness. And uncertainty comes, right? But if we have our hope in the right place, mm-hmm. we are not shaken, right? right? We stand firm on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And mm-hmm. that that gives us a certainty that can never change. Right. Right. Well, listen, so glad to have you here this week for a great uh, discussion. Um, We do plan on being back um, uh, next week. we got two more weeks of Unsung Heroes. Should we tell them what's around the corner? More Unsung Heroes. More Unsung Heroes. So, um, yeah, we might even have some different speakers, you know, in there bringing, bringing the word and bringing it home. So anyway, please come back. I uh, love, love having you here. Drew, love your guidance. Lucas, love having your energy and encouragement, you know, on the team. Just love doing, love doing it with you guys. Catch you next week.